During World War I, the Second Battle of Ypres was fought from the 22nd of April to the 25th of May 1915 for control of the strategic Flemish town of Ypres in western Belgium. The First Battle of Ypres had been fought the previous autumn. The Second Battle of Ypres was the first mass use by Germany of poison gas on the Western Front. It also marked the first time a former colonial force, the first Canadian division, defeated a European power, the German Empire, in Europe at the Battle of St. Julian and Battle of Kitchener's Wood. Topic: Background The eminent German chemist Walther Nernst, who was in the army in 1914 as a volunteer driver, saw how trenches produced deadlock. He proposed to Colonel Max Bauer, the German general staff officer responsible for liaison with scientists, that they could empty the opposing trenches by a surprise attack with tear gas. Observing a field test of this idea, the chemist Fritz Haber instead proposed using heavier-than-air chlorine gas originally preferring the use of the more deadly phosgene gas, though little was stockpiled for such a use. German commander Erich von Falkenhayn agreed to try the new weapon, but intended to use it in a diversionary attack by his 4th Army. This proved a fateful decision because with surprise squandered, subsequent gas attacks could not open a passageway. The gas would be released by siphoning liquid chlorine out of cylinders, the gas could not be released directly because the valves would freeze. A prevailing wind would carry the gas to the enemy lines. 5,730 gas cylinders, the larger weighing 90 pounds 41 kilograms each, were manhandled into the front line. Installation was supervised by Haber and the other future Nobel Prize winners Otto Hahn, James Franck and Gustav Hertz. Twice cylinders were breached by shell fire, the second time three men were killed and 50 wounded. Some of the Germans were protected by miners' oxygen breathing apparatus. The Ypres salient was the selected location of the attack. It followed the canal, bulging eastward around the town. North of the salient, the Belgian army held the line of the YSER, and the northern end of the salient was held by two French divisions. The eastern part of the salient was defended by one Canadian and two British divisions. The 2nd Corps and 5th Corps of the 2nd Army comprised the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Cavalry Divisions and the 4th, 27th, 28th, Northumbrian, Lahore and 1st Canadian Divisions. <laughs> <laughs> Battle In a record of the engagements of the British armies in France and Flanders, 1914 to 1918, 1923, 1990, E. A. James used the official names of the battles and other engagements fought by the military forces of the British Empire during the Great War, 1914 to 1919, and the Third Afghan War, 1919. Report of the Battles Nomenclature Committee, as approved by the Army Council, 1920. 21, to provide a summary of each engagement and the formations involved. In The Battles of Ypres, 1915 six engagements involving the Second Army were recorded. Battle of Gravenstaffel, Thursday the 22nd of April to Friday the 23rd of April. Battle of St. Julian, Saturday the 24th of April to the 4th of May. Battle of Fresenberg, 8-13 May Battle of Belleward, 24-25 May Action of Huge 19 and 30 July, 9 August Topic. Battle of Gravenstaffel Ridge, 22-23 April 1915 In the hamlet of Gravenstaffel, 50.891 degrees north, 2.979 degrees east, 
2.979 at about 5 p.m. on the 22nd of April, the German army released 168 long tons, 171t of chlorine gas over a 6.5 kilometers, 4.0 miles front on the line held by French territorial and Moroccan and Algerian troops of the French 45th and 87th divisions. The attack was launched on the 22nd of April 1915 shortly after 1700 French troops in the path of the gas cloud sustained about 6,000 casualties. Many died within 10 minutes and others were blinded. Chlorine gas reacts with water to form hypochlorous acid, destroying moist tissue such as the lungs and eyes. The survivors fled their poisoned trenches despite heavy enemy fire. Anthony R. Hasek of the Queen Victoria's Rifles described the chaos as the French Colonial Corps troops fled from the gas. Plainly, something terrible was happening. What was it? Officers, and staff officers too, stood gazing at the scene, awestruck and dumbfounded, for in the northerly breeze there came a pungent nauseating smell that tickled the throat and made our eyes smart. The horses and men were still pouring down the road, two or three men on a horse, I saw, while over the fields streamed mobs of infantry, the dusky warriors of French Africa, away went their rifles, equipment, even their tunics that they might run the faster. One man came stumbling through our lines. An officer of ours held him up with leveled revolver. What's the matter, you bloody lot of cowards? says he. The Zouave was frothing at the mouth, his eyes started from their sockets, and he fell writhing at the officer's feet. There was a four-mile gap in the French front. German infantry followed well behind the cloud, breathing through cotton pads soaked with sodium thiosulfate solution. As ordered they occupied the villages of Langmark and Pilken, where they dug in, even though they might have occupied Ypres almost unopposed, they had taken 2,000 prisoners and 51 guns. Canadian troops defending the flank of the break in identified chlorine because it smelled like their drinking water. The Germans released more chlorine gas at them the following day. Casualties were especially heavy for the 13th Battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force CEF, which was enveloped on three sides and had overextended its left flank after the Algerian division broke. At the Battle of Kitchener's Wood, the 10th Battalion of the 2nd Canadian Brigade was ordered to counterattack in the gap created by the gas attack. They formed up after 11 a.m. on the 22nd of April, with the 16th Battalion Canadian Scottish of the 3rd Brigade arriving to support the advance. Both battalions attacked with over 800 men, in waves of two companies each, at 11.46 a.m. without reconnaissance, the battalions ran into obstacles halfway to their objective, engaged by small arms fire from the wood, they began an impromptu bayonet charge. The attack cleared the former oak plantation of Germans at a 75% casualty rate. The British press were confused by the attack. The Germans set fire to a chemical product of sulfur chloride which they had placed in front of their own trenches, causing a thick yellow cloud to be blown towards the trenches of the French and Belgians. The cloud of smoke advanced like a yellow low wall, overcoming all those who breathed in poisonous fumes. The French were unable to see what they were doing or what was happening. The Germans then charged, driving the bewildered French back past their own trenches. Those who were enveloped by the fumes were not able to see each other half a yard apart. I have seen some of the wounded who were overcome by the sulfur fumes, and they were progressing favorably. The effect of the sulfur appears to be only temporary. The after effects seem to be a bad swelling of the eyes, but the sight is not damaged. Dusk was falling when from the German trenches in front of the French line rose that strange green cloud of death. The light northeasterly breeze wafted it toward them, and in a moment death had them by the throat. 
one cannot blame them that they broke and fled. In the gathering dark of that awful night they fought with the terror, running blindly in the gas cloud, and dropping with breasts heaving in agony and the slow poison of suffocation mantling their dark faces. Hundreds of them fell and died, others lay helpless, froth upon their agonized lips and their racked bodies powerfully sick, with tearing nausea at short intervals. They too would die later, a slow and lingering death of agony unspeakable. The whole air was tainted with the acrid smell of chlorine that caught at the back of men's throats and filled their mouths with its metallic taste. The Germans reported that they treated 200 gas casualties, 12 of whom died. The Allies reported 5,000 killed and 15,000 wounded. Within days the British were advised by John Scott Haldane to counter the effects of the gas by urinating into a cloth and breathing through it. Both sides set about developing more effective gas masks. Topic: Battle of Saint Julian, the 24th of April to the 5th of May. The village of Saint Julian, now Saint Julian, 50.890 degrees north, 2.937 degrees east, 50.890, 2.937, was in the rear of the 1st Canadian Division until the poison gas attack of the 22nd of April, when it became the front line. Some of the first fighting in the village involved the stand of Lance Corporal Frederick Fisher of the 13th Battalion CEF's machine gun detachment. Fisher went out twice with a handful of men and a Colt machine gun, preventing advancing German troops from passing through St. Julian into the rear of the Canadian front line. He was killed the following day. On the morning of 24 April, the Germans released another gas cloud towards the reformed Canadian line just west of St. Julian. Word was passed to the troops to urinate on their handkerchiefs and place them over their nose and mouth. The countermeasures were insufficient, and German troops took the village. The next day the York and Durham Brigade units of the Northumberland Division counter-attacked, failing to secure their objectives but establishing a new line closer to the village. On 26 April 4, 6 and 7 battalions, the Northumberland Brigade, the first territorial brigade to go into action, attacked and gained a foothold in the village but were forced back, having suffered 1,954 casualties. Despite hundreds of casualties, the Second Royal Dublin Fusiliers participated without respite in the battles at Fresenberg and Belleward. On 24 April the battalion, subjected to a German gas attack near St. Julian, was nearly annihilated. The German army first used chlorine gas cylinders in April 1915 against the French army at Ypres, when yellow-green clouds drifted towards the Allied trenches. The gas had a distinctive odor, resembling pineapple and pepper. The French officers, assuming at first that the German infantry were advancing behind a smoke screen, alerted the troops. When the gas reached the front Allied trenches, soldiers began to complain of chest pains and a burning sensation in the throat. Captain Francis Scrimger of the 2nd Canadian Field Ambulance may have passed the order to use urine to counteract the gas, on the advice of Lieutenant Col. George Galley Naismith. Soldiers realized they were being gassed and many ran as fast as they could. An hour after the attack began, there was a 1,500 yards 1, meters gap in the Allied line. Fearing the chlorine, few German soldiers moved forward and the delay enabled Canadian and British troops to retake the position before the Germans could exploit the gap. After the first German chlorine gas attacks, Allied troops were supplied with masks of cotton pads soaked in urine. It had been discovered that the ammonia in the pad neutralized the chlorine. The pads were held over the face until the gas dispersed. 
Other soldiers preferred to use a handkerchief, sock or flannel body belt, dampened with a sodium bicarbonate solution and tied across the mouth and nose, until the gas passed. Soldiers found it difficult to fight like this, and attempts were made to develop a better means of protection against gas attacks. By July 1915, soldiers received efficient gas masks and anti-asphyxiation respirators. Private W. Hay of the Royal Scots arrived in Ypres just after the chlorine gas attack on the 22nd of April 1915. We knew there was something was wrong. We started to march towards Ypres but we couldn't get past on the road with refugees coming down the road. We went along the railway line to Ypres and there were people, civilians and soldiers, lying along the roadside in a terrible state. We heard them say it was gas. We didn't know what the hell gas was. When we got to Ypres we found a lot of Canadians lying there dead from gas the day before, poor devils, and it was quite a horrible sight for us young men. I was only 20 so it was quite traumatic and I've never forgotten nor ever will forget it. The French soldiers were naturally taken by surprise. Some got away in time, but many, alas, not understanding the new danger, were not so fortunate, and were overcome by the fumes and died poisoned. Among those who escaped nearly all cough and spit blood, the chlorine attacking the mucous membrane. The dead were turned black at once. About 15 minutes after letting the gas escape the Germans got out of their trenches. Some of them were sent on in advance, with masks over their heads, to ascertain if the air had become breathable. Having discovered that they could advance, they arrived in large numbers in the area on which the gas had spread itself some minutes before, and took possession of the arms of the dead men. They made no prisoners. Whenever they saw a soldier whom the fumes had not quite killed they snatched away his rifle and advised him to lie down, to die better. Topic. Battle of Fresenberg, 8-13 May The Germans moved field artillery forward, placing three army corps opposite the 27th and 28th Divisions on the Fresenberg Ridge 50.868 degrees north 2.950 degrees east 50.868, 2.950. The German attack began on 8 May with a bombardment of the 83rd Brigade in trenches on the forward slope of the ridge, but the 1st and 2nd Infantry assaults were repelled by the survivors. However, the 3rd German assault of the morning pushed the defenders back. Although the neighboring 80th Brigade repulsed the attack, the 84th Brigade was pushed back, this left a 2-mile gap in the line. The Germans were prevented from advancing further by Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry PPCLI's counter-attacks and a night move by the 10th Brigade. The PPCLI held the line at a steep cost, their 700-man force were reduced to 150, who were in no shape to fight. After this, their unofficial motto, Holding up the whole damn line is still used today. Topic Battle of Belleward, 24-25 May On 24 May the Germans released a gas attack that hit Shell Trap Farm and to the area around the northwest, which was affected the most by the attack. A report of the event by Captain Thomas J. Leahy, of the 2nd Royal Dublin Fusiliers, shows that their CO Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Loveband was suspecting a gas attack and had warned all company officers. Later the Germans threw up red lights over their trench, which would signal a gas release. We had only just time to get our respirators on before the gas was over us. German forces managed to advance and occupy the British line to north and left of the battalion. The battalion was now under heavy fire from the German forces. 
But with shellfire and the aid from the 9th Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders they managed to hold their trenches to the end. Germans advancing under cover of enfilade fire, in small parties, finally occupied battalion line by 2.30 p.m. Shelling ceased but rifle and MG fire remained accurate and constant, whenever a target presented itself, until dusk. Topic. Aftermath Topic. Analysis By the end of the battle the Ypres salient was compressed, with Ypres closer to the line. The city, bombarded by artillery fire, was demolished. Although poison gas had been used on the Eastern Front, it surprised the Allies and about 7,000 gas casualties were transported in field ambulances and treated in casualty clearing stations. In May and June, 350 British deaths were recorded from gas poisoning. Both sides developed gas weapons and countermeasures, which changed the nature of gas warfare. The French and British used gas at the Battle of Luz in late September. Gas protection was somewhat improved with the issue of improvised respirators made from cotton waste pads impregnated with sodium hyposulfite, sodium bicarbonate, and glycerin. The respirators made little difference, however, due to lack of training and the use of local contraptions and poorly made items imported from Britain. The P-helmet, or tube helmet, soaked in sodium phenate was issued by December 1915, and the PH helmet effective against phosgene was issued in early 1916. Although many French troops ran for their lives, others stood their ground and waited for the cloud to pass. Field Marshal Sir John French, commander-in-chief of the British Expeditionary Force, wrote. I wish particularly to repudiate any idea of attaching the least blame to the French division for this unfortunate incident. After all the examples our gallant allies have shown of dogged and tenacious courage in the many trying situations in which they have been placed throughout the course of this campaign it is quite superfluous for me to dwell on this aspect of the incident, and I would only express my firm conviction that, if any troops in the world had been able to hold their trenches in the face of such a treacherous and altogether unexpected onslaught, the French division would have stood firm. The Canadian division mounted an effective defence but had 5,975 casualties by its withdrawal on 3 May. The division was unprepared for the warfare prevailing on the Western Front, where linear tactics were ineffective against attackers armed with magazine rifles and machine guns. The Canadian field artillery had been effective but the deficiencies of the Ross rifle worsened tactical difficulties. The Canadian division received several thousand replacements shortly after the battle. At 2nd Ypres, the smallest tactical unit in the infantry was a company, by 1917 it would be the section. The Canadians were employed offensively later in 1915 but not successfully. The battle was the beginning of a long period of analysis and experiment to improve the effectiveness of Canadian infantry weapons, artillery and liaison between infantry and artillery. Topic. Casualties After the war, German casualties from 21 April to 30 May were recorded as 34,933 by the official historians of the Reichsarchive. In the British official history, J. E. Edmonds and G. C. Wynne recorded British losses of 59,275 casualties, the French about 18,000 casualties on the 22nd of April and another 3,973 from 26 to 29 April. 
Canadian casualties from the 22nd of April to the 3rd of May were 5975, of whom about 1000 men were killed. The worst day was the 24th of April, when 3058 casualties were suffered during infantry attacks, artillery bombardments and gas discharges. In 2002, Clayton wrote that thousands of men of the 45th and 87th Divisions ran from the gas but that the number of casualties was low. The Germans overran both divisions' artillery but the survivors rallied and held a new line further back. In 2010, Humphreys and Maker, in their translated edition of Der Weltkrieg recorded that by 9 May, there had been more than 35,000 German casualties, 59,275 British between the 22nd of April and 31 May and very many French casualties, 18,000 on of April alone. In 2012, Sheldon gave similar figures and in 2014, Greenhalg wrote that French casualties had been exaggerated by propaganda against German frightfulness, and that in 1998, Olivier Lepic had estimated that 800-1400 men were killed by gas in April out of 2000 to 3000 French casualties. Lance Sergeant Elmer Cotton described the effects of chlorine gas it produces a flooding of the lungs, it is an equivalent death to drowning only on dry land. The effects are these, a splitting headache and terrific thirst to drink water as instant death, a knife edge of pain in the lungs and the coughing up of a greenish froth off the stomach and the lungs, ending finally in insensibility and death. The color of the skin from white turns a greenish black and yellow, the color protrudes and the eyes assume a glassy stare. It is a fiendish death to die. Topic. Subsequent operations The first attack on Belleward was conducted by the 3rd Division of 5th Corps on 16 June 1915 and the second attack on Belleward, a larger operation, was conducted from 25 to 26 September 1915 by the 3rd Division and the 14th Division of 6th Corps. The Battle of Mont Sorel 2 to 13 June 1916 took place south of Ypres with the 20th Division, 14th Corps, and the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Canadian Divisions of the Canadian Corps. The Third Battle of Ypres, also known as the Battle of Passchendaele, was fought from the 31st of July to the 10th of November 1917. Topic. Commemoration Canadian participation in the Battle of Gravenstaffel is commemorated on the St. Julian Memorial in the village. During the Second Battle of Ypres, Lt. Col. John McRae M.D. of Guelph wrote in Flanders Fields in the voice of those who perished in the war. Published in Punch 8 December 1915, the poem is still recited on Remembrance Day and Memorial Day. Topic. Victoria Cross recipients Lance Sergeant D. W. Belcher, London Rifle Brigade, T.F., 11th Brigade, 4th Division, Captain E. D. Bellew, 7th Battalion, British Columbia Regiment, 2nd Canadian Brigade, 1st Canadian Division. Jamadar Mir Dast, 55th Rifles, at 57th Rifles, Ferozapur Brigade, Lahore Division. Lance Corporal F. Fisher, 13th Battalion Royal Highlanders of Canada, 3rd Canadian Brigade, 1st Canadian Division. Company Sergeant Major F. W. Hall, 8th Battalion, Winnipeg Rifles, 2nd Canadian Brigade. Private J. Lynn, 2nd Lancashire Fusiliers, 12th Brigade, 4th Division. 2nd Lieutenant W. B. Rhodes Morehouse, 2 Squadron, Royal Flying Corps. 
Captain F.A.C. Scrimger, Canadian Army Medical Service, 14th Battalion, Royal Montreal Regiment Corporal I. Smith, 1st Manchester's, Jullinder Brigade, Lahore Division Private E. Warner, 1st Bedfordshire's, 15th Brigade, 5th Division Topic. See also First Battle of Ypres Use of poison gas in World War I St. Julian Memorial Third Battle of Ypres List of Canadian battles during World War I Langford Wellman Collie Priest Topic. Notes equals equals footnotes.